The news deals in conflicts and controversy. We hear from pundits ranting about the problems we face, but we rarely hear from those working on solutions. We think that needs to change. We're storytellers and social entrepreneurs. From our work and travels, we've seen that the human story is one of resilience and ingenuity. The challenges we face are real and daunting, but now more than ever, people are turning these challenges into opportunities. We both spent years working and traveling in conflict zones, going beyond the headlines. We met, sparks flew, and now we're taking on our biggest challenge yet. We set out to create a TV show shot around the world about people rolling up their sleeves to tackle social and environmental problems head on. Thanks to our 549 Kickstarter backers, we headed to Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, with our filmmaker Greg to shoot the pilot episode. This war-torn country is slowly emerging out of decades of dictatorship and repression. People have risked everything to make change happen, and now it seems change has finally come. We've come to get an on-the-ground perspective from the people who live here, and to meet those putting it all on the line to build a better Myanmar. The Shwedagon Pagoda is Myanmar's most sacred Buddhist temple. This 2,500-year-old mountain of gold glimmers majestically at the center of gritty, chaotic Yangon. The Shwedagon is a place to escape to and pray, but in the past, it's been the site of protests and bloodshed. This is one of the most important monuments to modern and ancient Buddhism. Originally, it was founded by King Okalapa. Yeah, that's it, Okalapa. And he enshrined eight hairs from Gautama Buddha himself. And now it's gilded over with 27 tons of pure gold. Damn, that is a lot of gold. <laughs> it's also encrusted with diamonds and gems. And not only that, the ancient kings and queens used to give their own weight in gold. And I think they used to one up each other like, oh yeah, you're gonna give your weight in gold? I'm gonna give four times my weight and four times my wife's weight and so on and so forth until you have what you see now, which is this incredible testament to people's belief and what they'll throw behind it. suffer, you rise up, you dare to hope, and you get crushed. This is Yangon, 2007. A military dictatorship has left Myanmar as one of the poorest and most isolated countries on earth. A place of ethnic conflict, child soldiers, rape as a weapon of war, and other man-made disasters. A place with a lot to protest. The last time people took to the streets like this was in 1988. That pro-democracy uprising ended with 3,000 dead and many more thrown into prison. Decades of horrific repression have marked this place, but so have protests, resistance, and civil organizing. As the saying goes, something's gotta give. And it seems that finally, maybe, something has. How's it going, man? Nice to meet you. I met Joseph Wai years ago while working with Burmese refugees in Thailand. He works with the pro-democracy movement. Can we have one, Myanmar? One. For now. One, one at a time. He's one of many people who've returned to take part in the changes happening here. Yes. Do you feel like you're making a difference? I don't know, but I'm happy that I'm part of I'm part of the I'm part of whatever is going on here. Yeah, what is going on here? <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to tell. You know? A lot, a lot of things going on. So. 
we barely had visitor before. So today, I think I think people just be happy to be connected to the people from other countries. I think. Now you know you don't have to lock up yourself in the room to listen to Radio Free Asia or BBC or anything like that. You know, yeah. so it's a really free environment. So yeah. people talk about politics, people talk about the government. They can talk about anything they want. You, you couldn't talk about those things before. There are a lot more people talking about human rights, democracy. You don't feel like you're alone anymore, so if you, you have a new energy, you know. A few years ago, the military dictatorship began ongoing political and economic reforms, supposedly as part of a path towards democracy. Hundreds of political prisoners were freed, including pro-democracy icon Aung San Suu Kyi. And with new labor laws and freedoms for the press, international sanctions eased and foreign investments soared. Here in Yangon, Myanmar's economic capital, business is booming. It all seems promising, but the past is never far behind. They arrested me and they took sent to me prison and in insane prison. In insane? Yeah. King Mong So, also known as Bobo, is one of thousands of former political prisoners in this country. He's a member of the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners, which advocates for the release of those imprisoned for speaking out against the government. What was your crime? Just just protesting the student protest? Yeah, yeah, student protest. I also participate in this uprising. At this time, a lot of political prison, a lot of the government, they don't, they don't trust this guy. Anything, anything, they arrest him. My, my neighbor, everybody afraid me because of I released from prison. My neighbor scared me. They, they don't want to talk to me because of they, they also want to go to the jail. He's now a driver with the Golden Harp Taxi Service, a social enterprise that creates employment for former political prisoners. Do you think that the changes that are coming are real? Yes, sure. I think, I feel, 2015, over, it can really happen. Mm -hmm. Not long ago, eating with foreigners while being filmed in public would not have been a good idea. You know, secret police and all. But now Bobo's main concern is filling the belly. And what's this? Uh, this is called Mohinga. Mohinga. This Mohinga is Myanmar traditional food. Every Myanmar, every day, every morning, every day, they eat, every day they like it. Oh man, that is good. <laughs> Somebody should come to Toronto and open a restaurant with Mohinga. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you will do it? Yeah. <laughs> We're heading to Karen State, site of one of the world's longest running civil wars, to see how the changes are unfolding there. But first, there's a place we've been told we just can't miss. So we're making a detour. You want to see my country real life, yeah. real Burma. If you want to see, you take train. Other bags, other vehicle, other transport, you never take. Hello, do we have? I'm okay right now. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank I'm good. You. No beer. Yeah. Yeah, beer. Oh, we are. Hello. I can only drink so much beer. One, three, three. Your name is Viola. Your name is Viola. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. When you're real to the rail, you can hear my love come down. Where hearts and heroes fail I won't be turned around There's something so liberating about being stuck on a train for 16 hours. You're forced to surrender and to be in the present moment. Or to have a few drinks. Tearing up these wounds Oh, yeah, I do. Cheers. I oh, you didn't even shoot it. Yeah, I am more hardcore than you. I got a head full of coal. Hear the lightning crack. Light a fire in my soul. And get me back home. Put your ear to the rail. 
You can hear my love come down. This is how you travel. Woo! That's right. Bagan. Somewhere between the mystical and the commercial, a glimpse of Myanmar's heyday, and a look at what tourism can bring. 10,000 temples stood here in the 13th century, and today, tourists show up by the busload to see the couple thousand that remain. It's stunning, but tells you little of what lies beyond and where we're going couldn't be more different. Ever since gaining independence from Britain in 1948, Myanmar has pretty much been at war with itself. There are over a hundred ethnic groups here with several ongoing conflicts. To the west, a slow genocide is wiping out the Rohingya people. To the north, the Kachin Independence Army and the National Army still trade bullets. To the east, in Shan State, some of the heaviest fighting in years took place while we were in Bagan, killing at least 200 and displacing over 50,000 civilians. Here in Karen State, the National Army and Karen insurgent groups are locked in one of the world's longest running civil wars. But tonight, people are partying, Karen style. Karen identity is rooted in nature. The majority of people here practice a form of Buddhism that incorporates ancient animist beliefs, according to which every living creature possesses a spirit, and the natural world holds spiritual significance. Most Karen live as subsistence farmers in remote villages where life is shaped, sometimes decided, by the elements, land, and weather. Our guide for the day, Mantain Lin, is taking us to see the sacred Sadan Cave, an ancient Buddhist temple buried deep in the mountainside. What do you do now? Uh, I just come back from Thailand for a few weeks. Yeah. Like many young Karen who fled the dictatorship and civil war, Mantain Lin went to school in a refugee camp in Thailand. He then worked seven days a week in the basement of a hotel in Bangkok doing laundry. Now, he's returned home, hoping to find work. What is your favorite uh, special place around here? Mountain, my cave. Do you have a favorite? For me? Yeah. Everything is everything for me. <laughs> this is a popular place for people to come just on the weekend. Yes. To walk around. This is amazing, this space in here. It's getting dark still. <sighs> I wonder if the bats like that, or if they're like, ah, oh, my ears. This is definitely Indiana Jones territory. It's great. I always wanted to be an explorer. You are an explorer, love. All right, let's go. How do we get down these ridiculously steep stairs? You jump. Don't, please don't jump. You slide.
Ooh, there's a, a puddle. Could that be a bat pee puddle? Come oh, on. Sure. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, he got some pee on him. Keep moving, we lost him. They peed on you? Yes. Oh, well, <laughs> we're almost out. It already happened to me, but it was a light sprinkling. <laughs> really? Love there. What does it say? He wants to meet with his girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's, that's a universal language then. <laughs> the art of bathroom and cave graffiti. <laughs> They're going back by this way or the other way. Outside there, we got some boats. What is it? It's another cave or? No, no, it's not, no. it's not a cave. It's boats and they the take you around. Boats? <gasps> and your face there. I'm on a boat. <laughs> yes, you're on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's like that. Oh, I have to sit. I can't sit like this? Oh, you're always a rule breaker, Nisha. Yeah, still like this, you know. Hi, a little anarchist. <gasps> I would freak out if I had to swim under there. Oh gosh, are we going through there? I really hope so. Oh dear. I just, uh... <sighs> okay, fine, I'm not afraid, actually. I'm just really happy right now. Natural wonders like these could bring tourists creating work for people like Mantain Lin. The question is, in 10 or 20 years, will Karen State still be a place you'd want to visit? So this Monday also, they are planning to take off that rock. We're with Sat Apo, an activist with the Karen Environmental and Social Action Network, scoping out some mining projects. He's asked us to film from inside the car so we don't get spotted. He trains and mobilizes communities to fight for their rights, livelihoods, and the environment. He's afraid that left unchecked, corporations and the government will plunder Karen State's natural resources. Government also, they need to their consent to the people. They can give their permission to the company, and then they have to follow up. They have to check out the, the community. The community take off the rock, too much rock. And the other side, they fell in the, in the table. This is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Several of the large companies operating here have close ties to the former military regime. A very crony company. Logging? Logging company, a lot of yeah. company. Logging company, Logging. before yeah. the mining and before the, the drug, uh, they have been a lot yeah. of uh, the black money. Huh? What do you feel the solution is? Because you need rock to build these roads that we're using right now. We uh, we need to take the rock from some mountain. But before they they planning the project, they start, they need to the assessment first. So uh, assessment how to impact if they they take off the rock. In a complex landscape where armed groups, politicians, and large corporations vie for power, Sothapo demands more accountability and fights for the underdog. And he's facing his biggest challenge yet on the Salween River. The Salween River courses through China, Myanmar, and Thailand. It's the lifeblood of the people who reside along it. They make a living from it, eat from it, bathe in it, and grow food on its banks. Oh, nice. That is right. Thank you. Whoa! Wow. So goopy. Is it good? Mm. Hot taste. Hot taste. Very good. Very good. Sweet. A long way. So, it's up to only here. This one, is raw, one, right? One only if you can, you cannot eat. <laughs> <laughs> but so somebody trying, no problem. Delicious. Yeah, delicious. Mostly the, we are we are cooking the wine. Yeah. Very delicious. Okay. No, I'll take his advice. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Mm. 10 million people live on this river and their communities are in grave danger. There are plans to build hydroelectric dams all along the Salween, currently one of the longest undammed rivers in the world. Here, the proposed Hatchie Dam will choke off the flow of freshwater and seawater will fill its place, rendering the river unusable to those who depend on it for their survival. So all over the world, we, we have only the 3% of the fresh water all over the world. If we, we don't have in this dancing area, fresh water is a problem. We, we don't have the water where we can drink. So we also move to the displacement food, displacement to the other, other places. Where does, the, where does the government think you'll get water from? I think government don't think about the people problem. They didn't think government about think only the profit. Kaysan and other groups have mounted protests against the dam. But electricity is needed in any country, so isn't a dam a good thing? So 90% they already stand an, an agreement to sell into the overseas country. So we, we, we have only 10%. So they're shipping the electricity out of Myanmar. Yeah, yeah. So 10 percent also the same company and government pay. Maybe the, the community only we got that two or three percent. Since 1949, the Myanmar army has fought against the Karen and their struggle for greater independence, with civilians bearing the brunt of the war. In a region with frequent violent clashes between the national army and Karen insurgent groups, people worry about the growing military presence around the dam site. So after the fighting conflict, they got the new camp very close nearby Hachi Dam. Only 15 or 20 minutes going with the boat. So very like they're occupied in this area. If they're, they're talking a peace process, they have to talk about that dam project. So we have the responsibility to protect environment, you know, people as well. I have to protest the Sun River because of this is a still virgin river. So very useful for the local people. In a land fraught with social conflict, South Epo fights for nature and for the people who depend on it. In a very old school place, he's asking a pretty visionary question. Yes, development will inevitably come to current state, but what kind? The kind that can lift all boats, or the kind that will put profit before people and the planet? Further downstream, Myanmar's fourth largest city, Malamin, pulsates with energy. Business and trade unite Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, and Hindus in this bustling seaport located where the Salween River meets the Andaman Sea. On the outskirts of Malamine lies a very big Buddha. We're talking two football fields of reclining Buddha, the largest in the world. Are you ready to get up in Buddha's head? <laughs> Whoa, look at that. Okay, I definitely want to just go chill in that ear right now. It's like a hammock. It looks legit comfortable. I imagine all the mysteries of life will be real. I had a mushroom trip like this. Something gets better and better. Cool. He's looking at you, Barnaby. No wonder they need cement factories everywhere. Hey, yo. I seriously don't know what this giant demon monster is. Look at that. He's gonna spear right through that woman's head. I know, he's spearing her head. On the 
inside demons drowning in a tide of hell. Alright, we did not attain enlightenment today. Speak for yourself. We learned that enlightenment for us is under construction. Oh, I'm totally not. So, where are we? This is, we call it Sultan's Tea Shop. Uh, it's called the Mango Shade. So we've tried just about every tea shop in town and we <laughs> have anointed this one number one. Greg and Rochelle spent years working in Thailand with displaced people from Myanmar. When this country started to open up, they came in to create Point B, a design thinking center that takes a new approach to international developments. As soon as uh, Myanmar opened, as soon as the sanctions were from the U.S. were, were dropped, we, we thought this, we should bring this in because it's a new way of looking at, at the world a new, and a new way of, of uh, processing information and, and going forward. Point B operates on the campus of Malamine University, the largest university in Mon State. Point B, development comes out of collaboration and is based in empathy and optimism. Students are trained to think creatively and critically about the social and environmental problems they see and to try to understand them by stepping into other people's shoes. Students immerse themselves in a problem, studying it from every angle before prototyping ideas to work towards solutions. Their projects range from water purification to upcycling trash to educating child laborers. We have to go to the uh, community and meet their community leaders like this. So that is really interesting. Point B students are gaining a new outlook and the experience to become entrepreneurs, innovators, and community leaders. My dream is to become the most successful businesswoman in Myanmar, and I want nice. to be participate in the world economic. Keep going. Keep going. You carry on. I mean, pretty much throughout this trip, garbage is kind of being a reoccurring theme because you're either seeing it or smelling it. Actually, living here, we are aware of every piece of trash we throw away because <laughs> no one picks it up. So if we have a soda bottle, of uh, glass, we've taken them, thrown, put them out in the trash can, and the next day we come out and the, tr the people on campus have taken them out of the trash can and thrown them into the field. And so there they are lying all around the trash can because they don't want to take them anywhere, because they don't burn. trash around Myanmar, but I've never seen this. This is, so they're raising animals basically yeah. on top of the trash. Yeah, and it's gonna sit there for a while. Uh, it's not gonna go away, it's not gonna de degrade. Uh, it would take up to, it could take up to 500 years. Um, yeah, and you have households right next to the site, and it seems like there's a whole community around it. Christopher Road Thorup of Denmark and Gawi Zarchihan of Myanmar are tackling the trash problem head on. So the people who live uh, near the, uh, how can I say, the trash, so they can't, uh, they can't stand it, the, the smell. So they have to ban and also goat or dog, they bite and they, uh, how can I say, spread so uh, it can get into their house so they can't stand, so they, uh, they have to ban. Yeah. So what happens when they burn it, all the yeah. smoke, Yeah. how does that affect people? Actually, to ban the weeds, uh, it's not good. Uh, uh, the first one is, uh, how can I say, uh, air pollution, right? And also fire, uh, bigger and bigger, and also it can dangerous for us. 
and the two of you are collaborating at point B. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. saw a prototype. What, can you tell us about that? So uh, what we do right now is that we, we work with um, the waste workers and a steel shop to design an optimal trash can for uh, for the campus. And then we're gonna uh, we're gonna design the whole organization behind it and the awareness on campus. And then hopefully we'll get a clean campus uh, very soon. And also by including all of those people, the faculty, the workers, yeah. they all feel like they had a say and they felt involved. Yeah, they, they felt involved and uh, they, they're gonna embrace the design and take care of it. It's a way better approach to embed it locally and, uh, and get people empowered. The, one of the most important things here in Myanmar is to take the first baby steps to change the status quo. And I think uh, what we do here at Point B is that we empower people to go out and, and change the situation in their community. And I think that's a very important first step. What we want to do eventually is to turn uh, burden into a possibility and that's where we are right now with, in terms of waste management and uh, it's a long transition and it's a, it's a tough uh, leap but uh, we'll hopefully make it. Thank you. A few years ago, this kind of collaboration would have been extremely difficult. It's just one example of how quickly things are changing and it's the kind of collaboration Point B is all about. So, can you tell me what design thinking means for you? Sure, so in simple terms, it's a creative process that anybody can access to come up with new ideas to whatever challenges might you might be facing. I think the, the key is prototyping, and I think that's why, again, we were accepted before, is because we're just prototyping. So, not to worry, we're not going to hurt anything, we're just trying something out. We're just trying. You're not coming in with this frame of, we have 80 million dollars. Yeah, 80 million dollars, and this has to work, otherwise the taxpayers are going to be really irritated, and if yeah. we don't show results, then, you know, we're lost our jobs. We're just coming in, let's try this. Yeah. I like that. For me, it just takes the pressure off, and like, let's play around. <laughs> <laughs> Someone once said, in order to make things different, you have to see things differently. Change comes from perception, and perception comes from altering what you do right now and, and trying to see either a vision of something you want in the future or to look at the problem from a different perspective. So I think being able to alter your mindset is, is an incredible thing. <laughs> And there's this, this possibility of leapfrog. I mean, this country has sun almost every day. So why not do solar? Yeah. I mean, why not skip the stuff that, you know, now in the West we're trying to distance ourselves from and go straight to the new economy, straight to renewables. Right. Yeah, and, and you've seen that happen in many countries like Singapore after the war, right? And Korea, Japan, Germany. So that's what, in some ways, we, we also say this is a benefit that you kind of, everything's broken down because now you can build them right. We don't by any means think that we're here to like save people or um, you know bring them out of poverty or something like that. We're here to collaborate and to be creative and have um, you know come up with good ideas and try things and learn together. I think that's that's really why we're here. Yeah and whatever happens happens. Maybe everything works, maybe it doesn't, but we do what we can. I've learned that with this is just do what you can instead of complaining about things and why are they like this and what's going on there and that. Just bring what you have and see what happens. Before we head home, there's one more place we've got to see. Oh, shit. To get there, you careen up a mountain packed like sardines on the back of a flatbed truck. We're going over a bridge? Why? Oh, here we go. Oh. Why not slow down? Why do they have to do this so fast? <laughs> oh god, this is like a 90 degree turn. Are you ready? Yeah. Holy shit. Oh yeah, the air is so fresh here. Pilgrims from across the country and Southeast Asia come to pray, meditate, and press gold leaves onto this giant rock perched unbelievably on the edge of a cliff. Legend goes that a single hair of the Buddha keeps it in place. Ladies are not allowed to enter. Oh man. Why would that be? I don't know, I guess getting too close to it just, what? Defiles it? Yeah. Sorry, love. 
it's all right. Bye bye. No one knows how it got here or how it stays put. I'm not exactly religious, but it feels kind of supernatural. Okay, so actually pictures and even seeing it from a distance do not do this thing justice. It is absolutely incredible to see in person. Myanmar is a place on the edge, caught between dictatorship and democracy, tradition and capitalism. After decades of waiting for change to come, it's hard to know whether people here will finally get the life they've been fighting for and praying for. Beyond the problems and the uncertainty, many people are making the best of it and rising up to the challenges. And those are the ones with the stories worth sharing, the voices worth listening to, and the struggles worth joining. Hey, this was the pilot episode of Uplift, and we want to produce a whole series. We shot this episode with a tiny team on a Kickstarter budget. So imagine what we could do with the right production company. We're out there now pitching to producers and broadcasters, and you can help us by sharing this episode on your social networks. And please, feel free to get in touch with us. We always want to hear from you. Word. Jobless. I don't know. You said jobless? Jobless. Jobless. Oh. oh, okay. Not Ladies jobless. jobless. We Don't. won't be jobless. No, we wanna but jobless. We wanna make the series, so yeah. we won't be jobless. We'll Hopefully. Be, yeah. We'll be jobless. Job jobless. Yes. Jobless. <laughs>